Uh, good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to the uh, Fellowship uh, Diploma in Lateral uh, Skull-Based Surgery 2018, uh, which is a curriculum-based training program in skull-based surgery initiated by World uh, Skull-Based Federation. I'm uh, uh, Professor Aligam Shaker from the University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, and uh, today I'll be uh, giving you a lecture on the extreme lateral approach. And uh, I'll be joining you later for <clears throat> uh, questions in a live format. So today we'll speak about the extreme lateral approach, uh, the various types of extreme lateral approaches, its evolution and its uh, different applications, both to tumors and uh, uh, vascular lesions. Uh, on this uh, slide, uh, you could see here, this is a view of uh, Seattle uh, as the uh, light is setting. And in the background, you can see here Mount Rainier. You could just have a, a view of Mount Rainier. On the right-hand side, this is a very famous um, um, uh, area in uh, the University of Washington with the uh, spring flowers, uh, cherry blossoms in bloom. So I hope that you all have a chance to visit and see it someday. So the, uh, we'll talk first a little bit about the evolution of the extreme lateral approach. Extreme lateral approach is essentially uh, an evolution uh, of the retro sigmoid approach and then um, it's a uh, downward extension uh, on one side. And also the uh, transtemporal approaches of Ugo Fish, uh, again, uh, going further in fairly. So the main uh, issue is that when I was uh, a resident, there was not such an approach for uh, foramen magnum lesions. And I struggled a lot, both with tumors and some very complex vascular uh, lesions. And I ended up developing this approach in, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, and then also with uh, Dr. Sen, who was working with me as my junior partner at the time. So uh, the retro sigmoid approach uh, had been in use for a number of years and had been perfected uh, at the University of Pittsburgh by Dr. Uh, Peter Janetta. And uh, Dr. Roberto Hiros, who was also working there for a short time, he then uh, developed the far lateral retro sigmoid approach, that is just simply extending it more laterally uh, to approach certain aneurysms. Uh, a similar approach was then developed, uh, which may be called the far lateral approach by a number of people, Dr. Sager in uh, Germany, Dr. Fukushima in uh, Japan, um, uh, Helmut Bertalanfi, who is uh, uh, again, a German surgeon who was working in Japan for a while, Dr. Robert Spetzler, Dr. Bernard George, who has done a lot of work in this area and so forth. Uh, I mentioned also uh, the transtemporal approaches, uh, Adelope Hugo Fish, uh, the transcochlear approach of uh, Bill, uh, Bill House uh, and Brackman. And then um, I had also done some work on the transtemporal approaches when I was at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. So uh, the extreme lateral approach uh, essentially is an approach that is centered on the region of the frame magnum and the C1. Uh, lateral mass, uh, and, and this is mainly for lesions uh, in the frame magnum area. And since it was originally described, further improvements have been made by a number of people. So the main concept is that uh, instead of moving the muscles from medial to lateral, we are moving the muscles from lateral to medial but in a physiological fashion. So that's the first concept. The second one is that we dissect and manage the V2 and the V3 uh, segments of the vertebral artery. That is the segments from the C2 foramen all the way to the uh, foramen magnum area going into the dura. Uh, the third is that we are going to remove, uh, if needed, uh, portions of the lateral mass of C1 and the occipital condyle. And uh, if uh, something uh, of quite a bit of removal has been done, then we have to manage it appropriately. 
So essentially what, we, what we'll have is a truly lateral approach to the craniocervical junction. Uh, we at the end uh, have to perform a proper reconstruction to avoid CSF leakage and to uh, achieve optimal uh, functional and uh, cosmetic outcomes. So this uh, slide shows the anatomy uh, of the uh, vertebrae in the frame and magnum area. We're seeing it uh, both from the side and also from the posterior aspect. Uh, I think uh, many of you are familiar with this. And uh, when you uh, look at the brainstem as it goes through this area, of course, you have the medulla and the spinal cord. And uh, on the right um, uh, hand side, you see the, the view as seen from the uh, side, the various cranial nerves and the medulla and so on. And uh, again, here we see the uh, medulla oblongata, that is the dorsal surface, and then you see also the ventral surface. And here are the various nuclei uh, as uh, they go through the brainstem. And here's a cross-sectional anatomy showing the various nuclei. If you look at the uh, blood supply, the spinal cord, uh, the spinal cord is uh, predominantly supplied by uh, two sets of uh, vessels. One is the anterior spinal artery, which in, in itself derived from the two vertebral arteries. And then you have a radicular, radicular medullary arteries, which connect with the anterior spinal artery. And then you also have dorsal spinal arteries, which are much smaller in size. And uh, the dissections performed by Professor Rotan, uh, which are illustrated in the slides, show the, the view of the structures as you see from the side, that is from the lateral aspect. And uh, here are dissections uh, showing the uh, view from the posterior aspect, and again, the lateral side. And uh, here now you see the posterior uh, structures. And uh, again, the, uh, you see the vascular anatomy. Uh, in this uh, slide, you see the uh, anterior surface of the spinal medullary junction. Uh, most of the patients have one dominant vertebral artery and one non-dominant vertebral artery. Uh, and of course, in some patients, one can be markedly dominant uh, as in this uh, shown in this case. And here also you see a fenestration of the basilar artery. And then not to be forgotten uh, is the venous supply. So there are a number of medullary veins. There is an anterior spinal vein and there are uh, lateral spinal veins and a number of medullary veins uh, may be present as well. This is a venous uh, anatomy as seen from posteriorly. What this shows is really is that there's a very rich connection between the uh, sigmoid sinus uh, through various emissary veins to the um, subcutaneous uh, the submuscular space. And also there's a very good connection with the vertebral venous plexus. So now looking at the types of uh, uh, extreme lateral and far lateral approaches, we talked first about the far lateral retrosigmoid approach. The extreme lateral approach has six types that we defined sometime um, in uh, the late 90s, along with Dr. Salas, who was uh, uh, one of our research fellows from Argentina. Um, Transtubercular approach, uh, which is used primarily for vascular lesions. Transjugular approach, which you use for um, jugular foramen uh, tumors such as uh, schwannomas and um, uh, glomus tumors. The retrochondral approach, which, uh, which is very similar to the far lateral approach. Then you have the partial transchondral approach, which is the uh, most commonly used one for uh, dealing with tumors. Uh, the complete transchondral approach, that is the one that we use when we are dealing with uh, chordoma uh, in this region. And finally, transfacetal approach, when you have a lesion that is going below the level of the frame magnum to about C2, C3, uh, that's what we use. 
So in terms of preoperative workup, just about, uh, it's uh, pretty standard for all the patients, but the special uh, things here are that you'd like to know the anatomy of the arteries and the veins in relation to the uh, extreme lateral approach. And this can be done by means of CT angio and CT venography, or in some cases, uh, cerebral angiography, especially if you're planning embolization, you could do that. Uh, and for vascular lesions, we try to perform embolization as long as it's safe. And uh, so uh, I'm going to show you a series of different cases, uh, vertebral artery aneurysms, uh, cavernoma, medullary cavernoma, parim magnum meningioma, uh, which are low, more laterally located or more anteriorly located, and then jugular frame and schwannoma. These are all different kinds of uh, approaches. Now, in terms of anesthesia and monitoring, we'd like to be able to monitor the motor functions and as well as the cranial nerves, particularly 7 through 12, during the surgery. So the anatomy of muscle layers is very important uh, when you're dealing with this approach. And uh, the way I teach it is that there are four layers of muscles. So the first layer is the sternomastoid muscle. You can see that here. And then the second layer, which is not shown very well in this uh, one, we'll see it in the next uh, images, are the splenius capitis and the semispinalis capitis muscle. Here you see that here, actually. And then uh, you also see the uh, longissimus capitis, which is attaching to the mastoid process. The layer deeper to that uh, consists of the suboccipital triangle, namely, the superior oblique, the inferior oblique, the rectus capitis, uh, minor and major. These are the uh, muscles. And then here you have the vertebral artery. This is the terminal V2 segment and this is the V3 segment. And here you all can also see the C1 nerve root, which uh, gives the branches to the muscles. This is another picture showing the same thing. And uh, this is, uh, you can't overemphasize the muscular anatomy because the muscles lead to the venous plexus, which in turn leads to the artery. And uh, then you can define the bony anatomy. So the combination of these things gives you the approach. Uh, the other structure that one needs to be concerned about the spinal accessory nerve it emerges from the posterior aspect of the sternomastoid muscle and goes down inferiorly toward the trapezius uh, muscle. But uh, one doesn't need to be worried about this until you get to about the C2 level. At C1, normally, uh, it's too high. But if it's at C2, then you need to worry about it. So one, what about the patient's uh, position during surgery? Now. As much as possible, we need to have the patient in the, with the head in the neutral position, just uh, straight, maybe a slight flexion. The reason is when you rotate the head excessively, the vertebral artery uh, may get kicked. And I'll show you that in a minute. So this is the position that we prefer. That is the uh, full lateral or park bench position. We position the patient with the arm uh, hanging off the table, but uh, supported by an arm board and well padded. All the pressure points are padded. This is a, a patient in an actual position. Here you can see that. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, we do not want to turn the uh, head excessively because that can kink the vertebral artery between C1 and C2. Now, once you've uh, positioned the patient and placed the electrodes uh, for monitoring and so on, there are two types of incision you can make. You can make an inverted U incision or a C-shaped incision. I prefer the lateral, the latter. That is a C-shaped incision. And that's shown here in this picture, the C-shaped incision, and that is reflected forward along with the sternomastoid muscle. The uh, second and third layer of muscles are then reflected medially. So the splenius capitis, then the semispinalis capitis, and the longissimus capitis, 
and then then the fourth layer uh, comes visible at this point you can palpate the c1 transverse process the mastoid tip are important landmarks the fourth layer again uh, you can cut them from c1 and then reflect it medially and this uh, also will bring you to the suboccipital triangle and you can see the venous plexus uh, between c1 uh, and C2 or, uh, or just inferior to C2. So how to find the vertebral artery? There are a few ways. The first one, of course, is the using the venous plexus, which leads you to the artery in the suboccipital triangle. The second one is that you can find the, uh, the lateral root of C2 and just deep to that, that is between C1 and C2 is the vertebral artery. Thirdly, you can also use a micro Doppler probe sometimes if you, the anatomy is distorted. And lastly, you can also use neuronavigation. I would say that that's the least useful because you can use, you can use all the other uh, techniques to get, get there before that. So this, uh, these drawings finally show you the vertebral artery exposed. And if you want to drill the bone, as shown here, then it's better to transpose the vertebral artery out of the foramen. So bring it back posteriorly. So this, uh, these two slides show you what happens when you rotate the, the head and why, why is uh, the artery redundant at uh, between C2 and C1. God has made it in that way because when we rotate the head, the artery is under stretch. So if you keep the patient with the head constantly rotated, uh, you know, then you can have ischemic symptoms. And that's called Bohunter's uh, disease or Bohunter's syndrome. Uh, and of course you do it during surgery, the patient can complain so they can have a stroke. So these are some cadaveric dissections now on the, on the left side. Now on the top left, you see the vertebral artery here, which has been unroofed and the C2 root. And then we have mobilized the artery medially in order to uh, drill off a portion. This is uh, the occipital condyle here. This is C1 lateral ma mass, just a part of it, like a posterior half or posterior third. So once you do that, and then you can open the dura mater, then you can see the vertebral artery going in, going through. These are the rootlets of C1, and then this is the spinal accessory nerve. And very often you'll also encounter the first dentate ligament. And without uh, much retraction, you can see the anterior spinal artery. You can also look around at the vertebral artery from the other side. So that's the elegance of this approach. And the risk of CSF leak is very low and the risk of contamination from the nasopharynx is not there. So it's a nice approach for intradural frame magnum lesions. This shows again the, uh, the artery being transposed. And here you see the uh, uh, drilling, uh, the occipital condyle, and this is a C1 lateral mass, which can be drilled. And uh, here we've done that. We had to get lateral to the artery. And you, it sh shows you how to make a dual incision going around the entrance of the artery. So uh, how do you manage the vertebral artery? Uh, I think very, very gently, of course, and very gingerly. Um, uh, the venous plexus, you can either cauterize it or inject fibrin glue to stop the bleeding. So we'll usually perform a small craniotomy and then drill a little bit of mastoid. Uh, and that's all you need for this approach. And then you can open the dura. So here in this cadaver dissections, again, we open the dura mater. You can see the cerebellum and uh, lower, this is the uh, spinal accessory nerve, vertebral artery. And then once you open the dura around that, you can see here, vertebral artery on the left side and vertebral artery on the contralateral side. So this is something that you can see very readily. Finally, in terms of closure, we always use a dural substitute. 
uh, because you lose some dura. And then uh, you can suture the graft to the adventitia of the vertebral artery. You, or if you had left a, a small cuff of tissue, you could do that. We use some fibrin glue, and then the muscles must be reapplied uh, in a physiological fashion uh, to allow vascularized closure. If there's cytocephalus, you can use the ventriculostomy. Uh, and what sort of potential complications? Vertebral artery injury can happen. No one should do this approach for the first time on the patient without going to the cadaver lab and working on at least 10 cadavers, becoming very familiar with the anatomy. The second thing is that you can have damage to the dominant sinus or the jugular bulb, the brainstem of the spinal cord, of course, cranial nerves, CSF leakage and infection. These are standard uh, uh, problems. So let's talk about uh, some cases, foramen magnum meningioma. So what do you want to do with a foramen magnum meningioma? Nowadays, the gold standard is you want to achieve complete removal, but without any damage to the lower cranial nerves and the patient. And uh, uh, Bernard George and uh, Bruno, who's one of his uh, students, have classified these tumors. Uh, in a, uh, such as a lateral and an anterior tumor, anteriorly placed tumor. And then also in relation to the vertebral artery, is it below, uh, at or above the dural entrance point of the vertebral artery? The more anterior the tumor, the more important to have the extreme lateral approach. Also, if the vertebral artery is going through the tumor and is encased, then you want to also use the, this approach. Uh, angiogram we talked about, uh, and uh, we can do some uh, embolization if there is supply through the ascending pharyngeal artery. So I look at these uh, factors, the superior inferior extension, the lateral to medial extension, the vascularity, encasement, consistency, that's of course only at surgery you will know. And you can define the risk of a tumor based on the size, vascular en encasement, invasion of major veins, uh, cranial nerves, prior operation, uh, such things. Uh, first, we'll talk a, a little bit about the transfacetal approach. So transfacetal approach is utilized when the tumor comes down below the level of the prime magnum. Here's the transfacetal approach, we drill the bone up to the facet, and including the facet if you want to go more anteriorly. So that's what's been done in this cadaveric dissection. And this is a, a live patient. And uh, this is an ideal case for transfacetal approach. You can see um, um, higher up, the tumor is directly anterior to the cord, but as lower down, it comes more laterally. And uh, this is during the operation when we exposed the tumor. It was a very firm tumor, and then we could remove it. Transtubercular approach is something that we utilize typically for vascular lesions because you are trying to remove the jugular tubercle and usually interdurally. So here's an example. This is a fusiform aneurysm of the ICA. You can see that. But when you open the dura, you don't see the aneurysm. So here is a cadaveric dissection. And here, what we're seeing is that we can remove portions of the jugular uh, process extradurally, but not completely. Here's the jugular bulb here, making a turn. And when you open the dura, this is the jugular tubercle that's in your way. But what you can do is that you can use a sonopet ultrasonic bone curette to remove that. And that's what's been done here. You can grade the extent of resection. You can remove as much as you need. And uh, the nice thing about sonopet is that it has no spinning parts, so you can use it in these areas where you have blood vessels, cranial nerves, et cetera. But 
The downside is that the solder pit is much slower than a drill. So uh, here's uh, a patient with a uh, prior history of ACOM aneurysm clipping. He presented now with a large fusiform vertebral artery aneurysm. So you can see that here, it's directly uh, at the level of the jugular tubercle. And you can see the aneurysm here. Uh, it was actually difficult to do an angiogram on this guy because he had a very tortuous vessels. And you can see here that uh, the aneurysm is partially calcified. So what was done was we performed a far lateral transtubercular approach and flip reconstruction so that the aneurysm was excluded and the flow was preserved. So we'll see the video here. Here we are making the incision, the initial C-shaped incision. And uh, the first layer ought to be already, already dissected. This is the splenius capitis now, which is being elevated. And that's the whole muscle. And you can see the occipital artery is going to lie between the splenius and the semispinalis that layer. So we are dissecting the muscles. So now you see the dissection of the inferior oblique and the rectus capitis muscles. And I'm trying to define the suboccipital triangle. You can see now we are elevating the muscle from the C1, uh, and that's it's, uh, and, and from suboccipital bone. When you get near the vertebral artery, you cannot use the monopolar artery. You have to be very careful. You can use a bipolar as needed. Now that's the Sonopet ultrasonic bone curette. We're using that. Now we're dissecting the V3 segment of the vertebral artery. And then making a small craniotomy. Here we are drilling the bone. That's near the uh, jugular uh, process at jugular tubercle. And now we're opening the dura. I, and here you can see the vertebral artery. That's the vertebral artery. You see one B, that is the B3 segment. Here we are opening the dura near the frame of magnum. So now uh, let's go back to the end of the video. There you go. That's the, uh, the aneurysm being clipped. You can see multiple clips being used to reconstruct the aneurysm and with temporary occlusion.
superiorly and inferiorly. Uh, application of some papaverin to release the vasospasm, that's all. And then uh, we're using here ICG angiography to visualize the arteries, make sure that they're patent. And now will come the closure. That's the closure. You can see the, how it's been closed. So that's a very complete operation, operative video. And at the end, you can see how the artery has been clipped. The aneurysm has been clipped, artery reconstructed. So this is a different patient. He has a dissecting aneurysm. He presented with a Horner's syndrome and a lower cranial nerve paralysis, essentially a Wallenberg syndrome. And the repeat angiogram showed that the right vertebral artery was nearly occluded and the dominant pica was also occluded at the origin. So there you see the, the stroke that's taken place. And here you can see that the vertebral artery on the one side ends in uh, uh, a dissection. That is the left side. Here you can see this one. The right side is okay. And 10 days later, when he had a follow-up angiogram, you can see that the, uh, there's very little connection between the one vertebral artery and the other side, and the pica is also isolated. So we want to close off the dissecting aneurysm and perform a bypass. So what was done is we exposed the vertebral artery and placed a short radial artery graph between the, uh, the pica and the vertebral artery and then close off the aneurysm. So here we see the muscle dissection. We go through, you've seen all of this before. So we're opening the dura uh, and through some of this. Okay, so that's the, the, the pica, pretty large, you know, and then we're going to do the uh, bypass into that. That's opening with a diamond drill. And we are suturing the graft to that. We're using, in this case, I think, uh, either 9 or 10 sutures. So first we suture the one side, and then we suture the other side together. So always, uh, not always, but most of the time, uh, I suture the distal uh, in first, and then the proximal end. And we use what are called figure of eight sutures, that is two interrupted them together, or just some interrupted sutures. And uh, on one side, I may end up using a uh, running suture as well. So now we, what we do is uh, we flip the graft and we're suturing the back wall. And here's the graft. So what we're gonna do is to put a, a temporary clip on the graft itself and bring it back. And we wanna see how good is the backflow. So we can see that. 
So once the proximal anastomosis is done, well, before we do that, we do a permanent occlusion of the vertebral dissecting aneurysm, which is already closed off. So we're just gonna do that, and then we do the proximal anastomosis. Yeah, there it is to the, uh, we brought the uh, end out and uh, we trim it appropriately and we're going to suture it to the vertebral artery, which is right here. So this, uh, of course, usually done with either 8-0 or, or, or 7 sutures. Same way, same technique, basically uh, one side and then the other. Here are the removal of clips, you can see. Uh, and then we're going to close the dura with a dura repair. And uh, here you can see the the um, uh, follow-up angiogram showing the bypass and the dissecting aneurysm occluded. So uh, vertebral artery aneurysms, depending on the location, uh, we may use far lateral or trisigmoid approach, uh, extreme lateral partial transcranial approach or transubricular approach. Here's another example, giant vertebral aneurysm, which is partially thrombosed. And here we use the combination of the uh, far lateral approach and the pre-sigmoid approach. And also I performed a vein graft bypass. And these are still pictures that show the aneurysm. So um, this is a patient uh, in whom uh, aneurysmography was tried but not successful. So we did a saphenous vein graft replacement and uh, this is the final uh, outcome of this patient who did pretty well. He had a small cerebellar infarct here. So uh, now the complete uh, transcondylar approach is utilized for frame and magnum uh, chordoma. So basically the tumor is in front uh, and involves the, uh, the frame and magnum and the odontoid process. So we have to remove the, the occipital condyle in C1 and at the end we'll do a reconstruction so I will show you this, uh, these chordomas and then we'll show you the example of the, uh, the prime magnum tumors. This is a young patient, five years old, and you can see she has a very extensive uh, chordoma in the prime magnum area going down to C2. And both vertebral arteries are encased. So this is uh, perhaps one of the worst examples I've seen. There is no way to resect this tumor uh, from anteriorly and get a complete resection. Also. If you try from the front, you will have uh, potentially damage to both vertebral arteries and the patient will die. So uh, this of course is uh, different views, uh, coronal and sagittal views. So first uh, we did the surgery. This patient had three operations and the operation has been speeded up. So first we did the operation from the right side. So that's the C2 nerve root you can see here. The tumor is very firm, as you see sometimes with young patients. It's not a soft tumor like you encounter uh, frequently in, ad uh, in uh, adults. And we are, that's the vertebral artery. We found it going through the tumor. You could see the vertebral artery here. And uh, I'm dissecting the artery through the tumor all the way to the uh, frame magnum area. And that's uh, what's left of C1 here. So we're going to remove all of that and some of the uh, condyle, that's some of the C1 and then the condyle will be coming up. So you can see that's the joint here. That's the joint and that's the remaining lateral mass of C1. And you need to remove that because you'll see there's tumor in front of it, anterior to it. A lot of tumor. 
So the, the function of this operation is to remove essentially the right half of the tumor. That's the goal of this operation. So that's the sauna pit again. I'm removing portions of the condyle. So there is a lot of tumor there, dissecting it from the soft tissue. So once you have the critical structures, namely the vertebral artery, the, spine, the uh, spinal medullary junction, et cetera, exposed, then you can remove the tumor in this area pretty uh, well, easily. Only thing is you have to be careful to remove everything. So there's some tumor coming out from the lower clival, preclival area. So that's the vertebral artery there, now completely dissected free. And now this is the C2 root. That's all the vertebral artery. So I we're completely skeletonizing and taking all of the tumor out in this area as well. You can see the vertebral artery is curving around to enter the dura here. Yeah, you can see that. So the only, uh, the best uh, treatment you can give these tumors, at least at the moment, is uh, complete resection followed by proton beam radiotherapy. There are a number of other experimental approaches being tried, none of which have uh, been proven to have any benefit as yet. See, there's a lot of tumor there. So now we are removing the abnormal bone of C2 with the sonopet. C2 lateral mass. So we're going to get all the way the dense, the odontite process. And what we'll do at the end is we actually, in this case, placed a bone graft between the occipital condyle area and the uh, lower portion of C2 lateral mass. And that actually fused up quite nicely in this patient. Okay. So this is, just gives you a flavor of what was done. And uh, so once that was done, we performed an occiput to C23 fusion in the midline because now the patient is already partially unstable. And uh, then we performed a similar operation from the left side. So first we operate from the right, and then similar operation from the left side. I, don't, I won't show you a lot of details of this. This is very similar, and you can see here the vertebral artery and tumor section. So at the end of all of the operations, you have uh, a, uh, the uh, tumor section. There's a small piece of tumor remaining, I'll show you. Um, so this shows you the sequence from the right, from the, the fusion and the left, and uh, a small piece of tumor left near the lower end. And the patient underwent proton beam radiotherapy and she's remaining free of tumor now, uh, not four years, actually around eight years since the uh, surgery. 
So this is a book of, uh, that I published here. Some of these details are provided. Now we're gonna talk about foramen magnum meningiomas. So I mentioned that foramen magnum meningioma can be more lateral or more anterior. So when the tumor is more anterior, the partial transcondylar approach is very useful. When it's more lateral, you can use a far lateral approach or retrosigmoid, uh, far lateral retrosigmoid approach or, or a retrocondylar approach. So this is a patient with a, uh, who's 58 years old and difficulties with swallowing and speech. And you could see that this is a tumor that is located more centrally, that is uh, uh, directly anterior and one where tibial artery is encased. And both hypoglossal nerves are involved by this tumor. And in this case, uh, of course, we did preoperative angiogram. We could not do any embolization. So what was done was a uh, partial transcondylar approach going from the left side. And you'll see that in a minute. So here is the retrosigmoid opening. We are removing uh, about a half of the condyle of the lateral mass has been removed. Here's the vertebral artery. And here we have the tumor exposed. And uh, you see in a minute the, uh, the uh, spinal accessory nerve. That's the vertebral artery going through the tumor. And we are working directly, that's the ultrasonic aspirator, directly to remove the tumor. The whole uh, idea of this is this brings you to the base of the tumor. So notice that there's no retractor anywhere and we don't need to retract the brainstem. As you go straight to the, the throat, base of the tumor. We can disconnect, we can uh, core it out there and then we peel the tumor away from the brainstem and the cranial nerves, which is what is being shown here. That's a spinal accessory nerve. In this area, you have to be careful because you have the jugular foramen. So uh, you cannot damage the lower cranial nerves because then the patient will have some problems, swallowing, et cetera. So we're removing a little more of the jugular tubercle here using the ultrasonic aspirator. and uh, vertebral artery is encased in multiple places. And we are dissecting the tumor off from the brainstem. See, with this approach, you can remove or resect the dural base of the tumor. So the tumor is arising from the dura, just anterior to it lie the various ligaments, the dentate ligament, the cruciate ligament, et cetera. So you can completely remove not only the tumor, but the actual dural base of the tumor can be removed, which is only feasible with this approach. So at the end, we irrigate our everything and uh, we will reconstruct the dura. So that's the, pretty much toward the end. There's the vertebral artery you can see. And uh, just putting a little gel foam in order to close the dura and then we'll take it out. So this is a post-operative image. Uh, and it looks very good. The patient had a complete recovery of uh, function, no recurrence and follow-up. Uh, here's another patient. She presented uh, as a man, 58 years old. Uh, and I wanna show a different point here. This man is uh, actually a WHO grade three meningioma, recurrent tumor, very aggressive. So this is a tumor. He has multiple tumor recurrences. You can see tumor here, and tumor C2 and so on. So the problem here, this is the angiogram, is that he has had multiple previous surgeries. 
So the muscles are all atrophic. So in order to promote healing, you need some type of vascularized flap reconstruction. So what we do is we work with the plastic surgeons and we use the vascularized trapezius flap. So here's the, uh, the drawing of the tumor operation. And uh, this is the video. I'll just show you a little bit of this. You can see the vertebral artery here, extradurally. And uh, uh, here's the completed exposure. And now we are opening the dura mater around the artery. And then it's a pretty vascular tumor, actually. You can see the uh, pretty uh, bloody nature of the tumor. So, and uh, this is a vertebral artery going through the tumor. And again, removing all of the tumor in this case. And that's toward the end where we're closing the dura. But the point I want to make here is, the, is this, that at the end, the plastic surgeons have rotated the trapezius muscle flap to fill that area. Otherwise, the patient may not heal because he's had previous surgeries and multiple incisions, uh, et cetera. This is the post-operative imaging. So here's uh, another patient uh, who's a 50-year-old man uh, Jehovah's Witness. So that means that they cannot take blood. You can see this tumor is not, uh, is at the foramen magnum, but it's actually higher. So this is foramen magnum to lower clivus. You can see that the extension, foramen magnum in, to the mid clivus, actually. And uh, this one, a far lateral approach is what we'll use. So no encasement seen on the angiogram. However, the vertebral artery and pica and perforators were encased at surgery. He had some preoperative embolization performed. And this is the angiographic uh, venous phase. So what we've done here is we use a combination of a far lateral approach. We also did a small uh, pre-sigmoid approach, but it was not necessary. But I was able to rotate the sinus laterally in this case. Uh, and then uh, imp and uh, use that approach. So here we'll see what uh, we find. So with this approach, we are going uh, lateral and opening the arachnoid. So the key with this operation, we cannot damage the lower cranial nerves. So how do you do that? So we can monitor the nerves. The nerves have created a natural space for you to work. So they moved aside. The tumor has pushed them aside. So you just use that natural space to work through the, and I remove it piece by piece, little by little, uh, using whatever you like, pituitary forceps, uh, bipolar cautery, uh, you can use. And here, of course, we have also devascularized the tumor, so it's not bleeding a lot. Little by little, we remove the tumor. And then we move the tumor into the space that I have created. So first I create a, a space, and then I move the tumor into, the, into that space. And here we're using what's called the three hands technique. Those of you who are in India, you're familiar with guards that have uh, six hands and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, at the present time, we have only two. So we use our able assistants as the third hand. So they, they provide the traction, suction, et cetera. In future, we may have some robotic hands, which can do the same. So this is the uh, now the 11th nerve, lower cranial nerves, 10th nerve, 9th nerve. But the tumor extends all the way up to here. So we need to bring the tumor down. And the tumor is uh, going to be around the vertebral artery. So we want to see that as well. So little by little, we move the tumor into that space. And we use the ultrasonic aspirator as well. And then, now we start to see the vertebral artery there. You just see it better in a minute. 
and I'm also bringing the tumor down inferiorly away from the seventh and eighth nerves. Just a little more arachnoidal dissection so that I can bring the tumor down. You see, I'm working between the ninth and the tenth nerves, moving the tumor down. And I'm dissecting the arachnoid using the suction. You see, the tumor is heavily devascularized. So now it's easier, it becomes easier. Once you devascularize the tumor, then you can remove small pieces. So you can see that uh, in a minute, you'll see the perforators going through the tumor. I'm dissecting them off. That's a perforator coming out of the tumor. You see that very clearly right there. There's a perforator that's coming. And that's a vertebral artery here. So where's the other side of the perforator? So you need to find that. So there is an arachnoid plane, and uh, you can dissect the vertebral artery, which is more or less a dominant artery in this case. So there's one perforator there, which, had, uh, which I'm peeling off. There. There is the other, there's another perforator. That's a little arachnoidal band. So, that's that perforator that you can see at the depth. You can very clearly see that perforator, which has been dissected off. So that's the terminal portion of the tumor. And uh, we are just uh, cauterizing anything just for the sake of safety. So then this patient, what happened? He developed uh, a sinus thrombosis on that side in a delayed fashion, which caused uh, just a pseudomeningocele. He needed, we put him on anticoagulation and lumbar drainage and he resol it resolved. Over time, the sinus uh, reopened as well. Um, this is just another case of foram magnum and meningioma. Very similar case. Uh, I, I think we'll skip this. Uh, this is a case with very anterior, you could see here, this tumor is very anteriorly located and both vertebral arteries are going through the tumor. So the approach is very useful for a case like that. I think that uh, I believe the point is being made. So I think that uh, this is a patient which illustrates one of the complications, the recurrent artery, meningi recurrent meningioma. Vertebral artery had been occluded by another surgeon already, and I reoperated. The patient sustained vasospasm, which we didn't uh, know about at the time, that the patient, it can happen. So you can see the vasospasm. We did an angioplasty, but in a delayed fashion. Um, and uh, so I think we will stop uh, there. Can you have occipital cervical instability? We have had only in one patient. I've operated more than 100 foreign magnum meningiomas in one case. I think we took a little bit too much 
how much condyle can you take off? About uh, usually less than a half. If it exceeds 50%, you may need to do a fusion. So you could see in this case, we took off a lot of condyle because the tumor was very anterior and we had to do a delayed uh, uh, occipital cervical fusion. So majority of cases, we're able to get a total resection. Major complications are cranial nerve problems. I had one patient that I showed you, death due to vasospasm, spasm, and one patient had aspiration pneumonia. So this is something that you have to be very careful about. I always work with our ENT colleagues at that time, I didn't have very good ones to work with uh, temporarily, but now I do. So uh, that concludes our uh, talk, and I'll be open to questions. And I thank you very much for your attention.